This video is going to be a bit different than what you usually see on my channel. Firstly, I'm not home in Florida. I am up in Syracuse, New York for the weekend. A family member bought tickets for my wife and I to see Elton John's farewell tour at the university's Big Dome Stadium. She purchased the tickets over a year ago, which was a long time to wait, but the date finally arrived and here we are. The show was Saturday, September 10th, and here are my impressions. Now the stadium is very large, and it was pretty much a sellout. So there were 38,000 fans trying to get to their seats all at the same time. It was very chaotic, and although we arrived with plenty of time to spare before Elton took the stage, we became literally trapped in a hot and sweaty bottleneck of humanity in the corridor for a lengthy period of time until we managed to wiggle and squeeze our way to a, through a passageway to the interior of the massive arena. When we finally got down to the floor, the lights were turned off and the band started walking onto the stage to huge applause. We found our seats just seconds before Elton hit the first chords of Benny and the Jets on his piano. Anyway, Elton John and his band were fantastic. The set list was amazing. One fantastic song after another. I'll leave a link to the set list below. Elton and his band played for over two hours and they really got cooking a few songs in. Elton's voice was strong and he is such a pro with 50 years of performing under his belt that he knows how to deliver the goods to a crowd of adoring fans. My eyes actually welled up a few times hearing some of my favorite Elton John, Bernie Taupin compositions live for the first time. Here are a couple of brief clips that I shot. Sports arenas, especially older ones like the Dome in Syracuse, were not built for musical performances. That means the acoustic qualities of the venue can be terrible. And the reverb inside the Dome was extreme, to say the least. And it took me, it took me a while to become accustomed to it. I eventually trained my ears to pick out the melodies from the din and lowered my hi-fi enthusiast standards in order to enjoy the excellent performance. 
I chuckle when I hear other enthusiasts claim that their hi-fi goals is to recreate the sound of a live performance at home. That's ridiculous. My goal is to attend a live show that sounds as good as my home system. But rack acts using mono PA systems inside large venues are loud, but not that great fidelity-wise. I go for the live performances and atmosphere, not for clarity, soundstage, and imaging. In the end, Elton said his goodbyes and finished with what else? Goodbye, Yellow Brick Road. This COVID postponed world tour continues on until June of 2023. While in Syracuse, of course, I hit a few of my favorite record stores. First, there was a four-story antique mall that was a few stalls that has a few stalls that sells records. Secondly, I visited Books and Melodies, which is primarily a bookshop, but does have a respectable used record and CD selection. And they also have a large basement chock full of $2 records and CDs. And lastly, I checked out the Sound Garden downtowns in downtown Syracuse. It's a big store that sells a variety of new and used records, CDs, DVDs, as well as posters, books, and t-shirts, etc. Are you interested in seeing what I picked up? The first album I found was Deep Purple's Machine Head from 1971. It was recorded in Switzerland to avoid those very high 1970s British taxes. And the casino they were planning to record in burnt down so they had to move the Rolling Stones mobile unit to a hotel. This is a hard rocking album and their most popular release that topped the British charts and did very well in America as well. And it featured the classic Smoke on the Water, which describes the circumstances of that casino fire. I found XTC's Skylarking at the same place. And this is a promo copy from 1986 which is often a good thing because they are usually first pressings with superior fidelity. And for only eight bucks, I decided to take a chance on it because if you look closely at the cover, you can see that this was an often played radio station copy. It covers, its cover has black and white Sharpie all over it. And looking at the vinyl, it's very dirty and smudgy. It's not a fresh example at all. And I also found Dire Straits debut album for $8 at that place. And I remember when it came out in 1978, when the track Sultans of Swing was burning up FM radio. And just when the new wave was getting my attention, I recall having the impression that Dire Straits were some kind of novelty throwback band playing a sort of country guitar picking Dylan-esque bluesy style. And honestly, I thought they were just some retro novelty act. I never imagined they would conquer the world just a few years later. Now looking back, it's been 44 years, the album has great songs, it's really nicely recorded, and it has fantastic playing. This is a super impressive debut by a band that appeared fully formed and realized just from the start. All right, everybody knows the classic double Led Zeppelin album, Physical Graffiti. And back in the mid 70s, I'd owned their previous album, Houses of the Holy, which I really enjoyed. So when Physical Graffiti came out in February 1975, I immediately bought it. But after listening to it for a few weeks, I actually sold or traded it to a friend. There was something about the recording that had a vibe that, I, that was unsettling to my teenage sensibilities. Anyway, I already own a rather rough copy of Physical Graffiti, and I've been looking for a better one. This is a cleaner, great sounding early Presswell copy that's not pristine, but a big improvement on what I have. And like a lot of old Led Zeppelin albums, they were played heavily back in the day. And a clean and quiet one can be difficult to find at a reasonable price. Joni Mitchell's For the Roses is a somewhat neglected album that fell between two of her more popular releases, Blue and Court and Spark. It did receive rave reviews when it was released in 1972, and it really is a gem of a record. Mostly Joni on acoustic guitar and piano with some percussion, woodwinds, strings, and a few touches of electric guitar. She has a definite knack for finding great jazzy bass players for her albums. Wilton Felder plays amazing bass lines on this record. It did produce a minor hit single with You Turn Me On, I'm a Radio, but her next, Court and Spark, 
was her mainstream breakthrough release that brought her to my attention in 1974. Ten years later, Joni recorded Wild Things Run Fast in 1982. And speaking of bass players, she actually married the bassist Larry Klein, who plays on this album. If you can look past some of the 1980s production values, this is a strong album that I've never really heard until recently. During the 1980s, I'd moved on from many of the artists from the previous decade. And if you take a gander at the musicians she gets to perform on this record, it's basically the cream of the crop of session players of the day. Amazing. I found Steve Earle's Guitar Town from 1986 in a $2 bin, and it's actually really clean, and according to Discogs, it could be worth about $20. Now, I wouldn't say I'm a country music aficionado at all, but there's something about Steve Earle that I've liked since I first started listening to his CDs in the 1990s. In my opinion, he's more a rock and roll with a country flavor, you know, sung with a strong southern drawl, than pure country. And Guitar Town was his debut that featured bittersweet tales of heartache, small town life, loneliness, and tough times living in Reagan's 1980s America. This album really put him on the map when it topped the charts and was nominated for several Grammy Awards in 1987. And it's also one of the very first country albums that was recorded digitally. And it does have that bright kind of digital sheen that you may be familiar with on 1980s recordings. Lastly, like most people, I missed the boat when Big Star was releasing their three albums between 1972 and 76. And it wasn't until decades later that I heard the sad, unfortunate Big Star story. And it wasn't until I started streaming that I was actually able to listen to Big Star's music. And theirs is a tale of an incredibly talented four-piece four band from Memphis, Tennessee, who released a record that received universal critical acclaim, but no one bought it. Immediately, the band started splintering apart, but they carried on with some different lineups for two more releases before throwing in the towel. In the early 1990s, the band's leader, Alex Chilton, reformed the band, and they enjoyed a second life until his sudden death in 2010. The original 1970s pressings are pretty pricey, but when I found this modern release at the Soundgarden in Syracuse for $25, I bought it. I also found three CDs that the Books and Melodies owner threw in for free with the four albums I purchased. Buffalo Tom's Big Red Letter Day, Suede's Dog Man Star, and The Eagles Greatest Hits Volume 2. All excellent titles. So I can happily say that our Elton John Syracuse Getaway Weekend was, a tr was tremendous fun and a roaring success. Let me know if you would enjoy seeing more live show reports and talking about records videos like this. Thanks for watching and peace out.